All right, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. We're just going to read a few verses, 38 to 40. When you got it, somebody shout, I'm ready. I'm ready. So then, then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail, and David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. He says, I can't go in these, so I'm not used to them. So David took, this is key, he puts them into his shepherd's bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Today, I'm going to preach, as part of this series, I want to preach from the subject, Scam Likely. Everybody say, Scam Likely. You can be seated in this church, uh, scam likely. Um, I hate to say this, and I hate to admit it, but we're a truth church. Tell somebody, we're a truth church. So as many great things, I, I'm an 80s baby. Any 80s babies? Greatest generation ever, biblical and historical facts only. Biblical, historical facts only. Um, as great as I was raised and as many wonderful things that I was privileged to, one thing that I have to come truthful about, I have to come honest and come clean about, is that growing up, the saints taught me how to lie. The saints, they taught me how to lie. Uh, my grandmother, God rest her soul, Smitty City, love her. Miss her. Um, my mom, my aunts, my uncle, growing up in a big house with all of us, um, they taught me some great things. They instilled some good things in me, Sean. But one of the things they taught me how to do really well was to lie. The problem with them teaching me how to lie is that it really wasn't my fault. <laughs> because they put me in a situation where I had to choose between following what God says, and getting whooped. Now, I, I know some of y'all are like, that's child abuse. We are mandated reporters. But in the 80s, if you didn't die, it wasn't child abuse. And so you got spankings for some stuff. What do you mean they taught you how to lie? Because um, we'd be in the house, and there was this, there was this thing. Now, some of y'all might check out. Uh, some of y'all will understand what I'm talking about. There was this thing that we had in the 80s called a house phone. Yes. Anybody remember a house phone? Yes. And, 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 and when we started really getting bougie, we had the long cord house phone. The one where you can walk all the way to your room, wrap yourself in it. <laughs> phone be in the kitchen, but you upstairs with that long cord. You ever pull the cord and the tension's in it shaking anyway? I'm in the house, and um, it taught me how to lie because they would get a phone call, and um, they would say, hey, Mrs. Smith. She's like, who's calling? Is it, uh, this is at and She's like, hold up. Uh, Jason. she give me the phone. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> and then I get on the phone and say, hello. They say, hello, Mrs. Smith. I said, no. Um, she said she's not here. My grandma, boy, hang up that phone. They, they taught me how to lie because they, they didn't want to face who was, who was calling on the other end. Anybody's parents taught them how to lie, tell them, I'm not home. Just tell somebody I'm not home. Um, but in time, things evolved, and, you know, things got better. So we didn't just have the phone with the long cord anymore. We upgraded and got cordless phones. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And then when we really started balling, we had answering machines. Anybody remember those? And, and they had the answer machine with the big tapes at first. Yeah. Then they started making with the mini tapes. And, and I told my truth earlier. I was one of those kids. I tried to get home before the school called to go erase that tape or put a new one in. See, y'all don't know about Deacon. I was like, I can't believe you did that. I just, he was a good kid, but I, I, I had problems. And, um... You know, then, then we really got good, and we had something called call waiting. What? 
Because see, when you were a kid in the 80s, you couldn't stay on the phone a long time because your parents say, I'm expecting a call. Don't touch that phone. But now that you got call waiting, you can be on the phone as long as you want. <laughs> then, then we got fancy because after uh, call waiting and all that stuff, we got rid of all those devices we had. And our new phones gave us something that the old phones couldn't. That was caller ID. Oh, man. And that changed the game. God delivered me. I didn't have to lie no more. Because we could see who's calling. And we move forward to a generation of the cell phones. And some of y'all know about having a cell phone. You ever have a cell phone and it was off, but you would stunt like it was on? Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you walk around like, yeah, let me call you right back. You know that joint's all the way off. Them old Nextels that used to chirp and, you know, yeah, y'all were really unsafe. If you had one of those, you definitely weren't saved because we did some things with those phones. But anyway, I just, I'm just, we're going to pray for Tiff today. But I, I want you, to, as we developed in time, um, God decided not only to send Jesus into the world, but he sent a man by the name of Steve Jobs. To deliver unto us something that was fruitful and should multiply called the iPhone. And, and, and you know, at first, when I had my phone, they got me, y'all, because they called me. See, back in the day, you knew if a bill collector or somebody you didn't want to talk to was calling because you see that weird freaky number like 888 or 800 and you'd be like, oh, I ain't calling this. I'm not answering this. But see, they got good, and they started getting local numbers. I remember they got me because, you know, I'm like, I don't know who this is. So I answer, I'm like, hey, hello? They're like, hey, is this Jay? I said, what up, Jay? I'm like, hey, what's good, man? Who's this? I, I, you know what you say when you don't know the number? Yeah, I just got a new phone. Who's this? And I'm like, actually, this is Kevin from Visa. I'm like, ah, oh, and you hang up. <laughs> And so God decided to deliver us and help us by giving iPhone the ability to give you a heads up so that when you get a call that you should not respond to, on your phone it will say, scam, likely. And, and I want to help you today because many of you are laughing and we're smiling. That's wonderful because it works for our phone. But unfortunately, it doesn't work in life. Uh, imagine if some of the people that you have a relationship with came with a scam likely warning. If some of the people you dated came with a scam likely If some of the jobs you worked at. If some of what they called an opportunity came with a scam. Like, but unfortunately, life is not that way. And it doesn't come with a scam likely warning. That's so obvious. And I think that. One of the things Holy Spirit wants to do, he wants us to give, he wants to give us a scam, likely, warning. Here's the thing, because it's going to get good in a second, and I'm going to let you go have some lunch. Um, in today's text, there's a twist. Because many times, even as I started to read this, the first thing we start thinking about when we think about David is we think about David and who? See, you already went there. Your head, your heart, everything about you went into David and Goliath. And, and you mentally and emotionally jump where most people jump. And that is David defeats Goliath. We get excited because this story feels good to us because it's talking about an underdog who wins, who God is going to fight for him. And he's going to be a champion. and He's the least likely and all of these things. And we get excited about it. But here's the thing many of us miss. And I'm looking for my 90. Who's my 90 percent today? If you know, you know, who's my who's my 90? 90 percent of people who take notes when I preach go to heaven. So I want to make sure I got you today. Here's the thing. We like to jump right to when God promotes us. We like that story. We like to get to the Goliath part because David wins. But one of the things I've learned that whatever God is doing in your life and wherever he's calling you to, he always prepares you before he promotes you. And many of us want to jump to promotion rather than experience preparation. 
Whenever you try to jump to promotion and victory and celebration, before you're prepared, you'll find yourself losing. Losing the very thing you believe God for, losing the very thing you trust in him for. Okay, okay, I dare you to get married without getting ready. You're trying to get married without premarital counseling. Let's see how long your marriage is going to last. Let, let, let you not get your credit in order. Let you not put a few dollars in the bank before you get married. It will be a rude awakening where your life will be without preparation. There's a lot of people that go and run the marathon, and it's a great thing. But I dare you to go run the marathon without preparation. I know you want to get on your diet plan, and you want to be vegan, and you want to eat, and you want to, you know, be healthy and do all this stuff. But I dare you to do it without preparation. They even tell you if you're going to have a successful diet plan, the first thing is food preparation. So you got to understand that preparation is key. So here's the first thing I want you to write down because it's going to get good. I got to give you this and we got to get ready to go soon. I want to give you this because it's good stuff. Here's the first thing you got to write down. If you miss this, you will miss everything. You will miss everything. If you don't write this, I promise you, you better write this down because this is good stuff. Here's the first thing you got to get. We see it in the text. It says you can't have the calling if you can't handle the criticism. Where's my church? If you want the calling of God, then you have to be willing to deal with the criticism that comes with it. And many of us want the call, but not the criticism. And here's the problem. We look at Goliath and we look at him defeating Goliath and him defeating Goliath is the promotion. But if he, if Goliath is the promotion, then criticism has to be the preparation. Mm. It's going to get good, I promise you, but you got to see it because too many of us, we want something that we're not prepared for. We want the stage. We want the platform. We want the lights. We want the likes. We want people to love what we do. We want to be celebrated, but we don't even understand how to handle criticism. And being able to handle criticism is key to your calling. Because the truth is, everybody's not going to celebrate your success. There's going to be people who always find fault in your best day. Hmm. There's going to be people that are competing with you privately. There's going to be people that are slapping you on the back saying, good job, but they're really waiting for you to fail. There's going to be people, you can have your best, everybody can celebrate you, but it's going to be that one person who doesn't clap as loud. They will clap just because they're in the crowd. And my grandmother taught me something. Just because they're in the crowd does not mean they're in your corner. So you got to be careful. Watch how people clap when it's your turn. But you got to understand that criticism is a part of the call. And many of us want the call, but we don't want to deal with criticism. And here's the thing, because I don't want to rob you of the richness of this text. If we just jump to Goliath and jump to the celebration, then this message is pointless and you might as well just go home now and go have some lunch. But if you really want to lean into what God is showing us, something big happens. There's some victories that happen before Goliath. And the first part we see is that David, the context of this and is the backdrop is in chapter 16. When David is at home, he's dealing with criticism. Before he ever gets to Goliath, he's dealing with criticism at home. And can I tell you, before you ever deal with some things publicly, you better let God prepare you to deal with some stuff privately. Because all the stage and the lights do is illuminate your issues. Oh, come on. I, I know it looks good and it feels good. You're like, Pastor Jay, you're up there preaching. But you got to understand, the same way my gift is on display, <laughs> my issues are on display. David is at home dealing with an issue. And before he ever goes public, he has to deal with some, some stuff privately. He's at home. And the Bible says he's a shepherd. Everybody say he's a shepherd. He's a shepherd dealing with sheep in the yard. And while he's in the yard, the Bible says God tells Samuel, I'm anointing a new king. When he says I'm anointing a new king, he says, but be careful when you get there. He's not going to look like what you think he should. He's already did this. What, what happens when God is criticizing you? God says, man looks at what? The outward appearance, I look at the heart. So even God is saying, he don't look like much. Okay, let me go deeper. God says, he doesn't look like what I called him to be. 
So I need you to see different because he's greater than what he looks like. So now he's dealing with criticism. Samuel comes and he's getting ready to anoint the king. He goes to Jesse's house. But watch this. His dad, Jesse, David's dad, doesn't even call him into the house. Criticism. He says he's not even worth calling. He's not even worth the consideration. So now he's dealing with criticism from Samuel in church, represents God. He's dealing with daddy issues. Now watch this. His brothers come in the house, but none of his bros go back and get him. Nobody says, hey, David, yo, we about to go get ready. So David's now in the yard, and he's watching them get ready for something that he can't partake in. Jesus. Criticism. He's dealing. Everybody say criticism. But let me challenge you, because if you can't handle criticism in obscurity, then how are you going to handle it when you're in notoriety? And many of us think that you, you got to remember, it's, everybody say it's the small things. Because how you manage in the small things will just be a picture of how you handle it on the bigger scale. Watch this. This is why some people say, well, I can't afford to give and I can't afford to tithe and I can't afford to be generous. And I, my 10 percent right now is tough. But when I get more, I'm going to give. You're lying because the same bad habits you had before are only going to increase when you get more. I knew you were going to be quiet. Let me talk to y'all. So the, the, what you do with the little is an example of what you're going to do with the much. That's why God says, if you are faithful over the little bit, I will make you ruler over a lot because I can trust you with the little. And if you think that you're going to be a one way with the little and different with the big, then you're playing. That tells somebody that's a scam. The devil will try to get you to think that when you get to your there, that's when change happens. But can I just break the curse of the enemy over your life and tell you don't wait till you get there. Be it now. Do it now. Say it now. Think it now. Walk Walk in it now. Somebody shout now. now. I want you to get it because what God is trying to do, he's trying to mature you to a place that you can handle criticism for your calling. Here's the thing, and what I think maturity does, maturity prepares us for the size of the call, but it also prepares us for the size of criticism. And I know you're wondering, why am I staying on this point so much? It's because I've learned something in, in church uh, that, that people don't really handle criticism well. No, they don't. No, they don't. If we tell you you could have did better, you're ready to quit right now. Yes. If somebody corrects you or critiques you, you ready. I, I need to have a meeting with the pastor. You ready to cuss them out and go off. You walk out of church. Uh, they're lucky. They don't know what I used to be and what I used to. And you ready to go off on people that critique you. Okay, let me talk about me because y'all don't like that. I had this video. It had 14,000 views. And I was excited. I was like, you know, my brother and my son, they're laughing like, oh, good job. They get that in their sleep. But for me, I was excited. They're shady. But I was excited. <laughs> like, you know, and when you get 14,000 views, I'm trying to make it 15. So I figure if I watch it a thousand more times, I can get to 15,000, right? I'm trying to do it. If nobody do it, you do it for yourself. Forget y'all. I'll do it myself. I'll Play it again. Play it again. And the number didn't go up. But anyway, here's the thing. I'm watching. I got this video, 14,000 views, a couple hundred comments, and I'm reading the com I'm loving the comments. I'm laughing like, oh, that's a good. Hey, appreciate the encouragement. All these great comments. But there was this one comment. Hundreds of comments, thousands of views. But this one comment. It frustrated me. It pulled me back to my past. Like, you, do you know who I am? Do you know? Who, and I'm reading this like, oh. you ever read something you walk like, yo, yo, just, and you're trying to feel, like you respond, you know when it's really bad? When you have to delete 15 responses. I'm like, okay, God, let me. And I'm sitting there, 14,000 views. Hundreds of comments, but I'm focused on one negative critique. And in my head, I'm like, see, that's why I don't want to post nothing. See, that's why I don't even want, I hate social media. And then, uh, and see, and I'm getting all worked up about one critique. 
Now I'm praying that God blesses our church. I'm praying that God expands our platform. I'm praying that God will do something ridiculous and we'll sit back and laugh and go, oh, millions will be easy for us. But how can I celebrate the millions if I can't handle the critique in the thousands? Many of you are like me. You allow one thing that you deem negative to shift your focus off where God's trying to take you. So you got to be able to handle the criticism if you're going to walk in your calling. And here's the thing. Maybe the problem is not about God releasing you into your call, but maybe he's protecting your call from your inability to handle criticism. Let me say it again. You're slow but worth waiting for. Some of us are crying out, God, please release me into my call. And you're waiting for your time. But maybe God is not, it's not that he's not trying to release you. Maybe he's protecting your call because you don't have the ability right now to handle criticism. Because he can put you in a place where your calling is amazing and you can do some great things. But if you can't handle criticism, then your calling doesn't matter. Because the moment you get in that door and they tell you something you don't like, you're going to cuss everybody out. You're going to forget the fact you're a Christian. You're going to forget about G- Jesus who? I- I'm just saying. You, you, you're going to backslide all the way. And, and you're going to forget about the fact that God called you to this and criticism is a part of the calling. Here's the thing. David had to deal with this and he had to allow, to allow criticism to become fuel for his faith. And many of us allow criticism to become fuel for our fear. And so we get afraid when we think people are judging us. Everybody that has something to say is not judging you negatively. But critique is healthy. Do you realize there's some, there's some comments that I don't like, but they help me to be better? And can I be honest? Some of the best things that helped me the most were from people that didn't like me the most. Because mm. your friends will tell you you're cute in that dress and you're not. Girl, you don't look good. You look cute. You've got it going, okay. Your boy be like, all right, I see what you're doing, fam. But at the end of the day, they're like, oh, that wasn't true. But your enemy's like, hmm, you see what she had on? I can't believe she wore it. It's all extra short. And, this, and you're like, oh, really? Your friends won't tell you some stuff that your enemies will. So sometimes even God will use critique not to kill you but to build you up. So, so watch this. So David allows it to be fuel. He's dealing with this issue. He has to deal with some stuff at home. And deal with some stuff privately before he deals with it publicly. Because he's dealing with it with his brothers. He deals with it with his father. And my question for you is, what do you do when you're not even recognized by people who are supposed to know you? How do you, how, how do you handle when people that look like you misjudge you? People you've done the most for hurt you the most. David's dealing with criticism from people who should have called him. People that should have included him. And he has to deal with criticism. But here's the thing. You, you got to write this down. This is big. Point number two. Write this down. Your ability to be is not based on their ability to see. I know that's a bar. And I was a rapper in my former life. But it's still good. Your ability to be is not based on their ability to see. What I love about this is that God never consulted anyone about your calling. God never called and said, hey, how do you feel about such and such? Hey, can you tell me about Nakia? I'm trying to see if she's worth the call. Tell me about Jenny. Tell tell me about Speedy. Tell me about Antoine. Tell tell me (laughs) about... If you know, you know. Tell me about, tell me about Rashawn. T- tell me. No, God didn't do that. When he called you, he, he was aware. And he never consulted anyone. God made a clear decision about calling you. And I don't know who this is for, but God's getting ready to break your need of acceptance. He's already made up his mind about you. 
And so I want you to get in, I want you to get this in your heart that God is getting ready to do something in you that, that is different, but you have to understand that when he calls you, it wasn't based on anybody's ability to see you. He called you based on what he, thank you, said about you. Somebody shout, he called me. Watch this. And because you said that, I want you to get this. Because he called you, you have to be okay with being judged. You have to be okay with being misunderstood. Let's go to the next level. You have to be okay with people intentionally lying on you. You, you have to be okay. Why? Because some people are stuck and they can't even help themselves. And you're too busy trying to get people who are stuck to see something that they can't see. How do we know that? I'm not just saying it. How do we know that they're stuck? Because we see it in the text. The Bible says before Samuel goes to see Jesse at his house and anoint a new king, God says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn after Saul? Now understand at the time, Saul was not dead, but he was not chosen. Saul's season, even though he was in the seat, his season was over. God said, I'm no longer with him. So why are you still crying about something I'm not studying? Why are you still worried about something I'm not thinking about? Why are you still trying to hold on to something that should have died in the last season? Stop going to where I'm not any longer. He tells him, get, just tell somebody, get off stuck. You didn't tell the right person. Tell somebody, say, get off stuck. You have to see this because when he tells him to stop being stuck, how do we see it? Because when he gets to the house, they call them. He says, where are your sons? He brings the sons. The first thing Samuel does, he looks at the first son. The first son's name is Eliab. When you look at who these sons are, the Bible says Eliab is tall and good looking. He looks just like Saul used to. So now he thinks the king is going to look like the king before. Everybody say, get unstuck. Yeah. And so what God's trying to do, he's telling him, stop mourning after where I am no longer. Because what I'm doing is not going to look like what I did. Oh, my God. Who I'm using is not going to look like who I used to use. So sometimes it's their attachment to the past that's blinding their ability to see in the present let me say that again the reason they're stuck is because it's their attachment to the past that's blinding their ability to see in the present and you're trying to get people to believe something that they don't have the ability to see right now but I don't need everybody to see what God said I'm gonna walk in God said and be who God said even if you can't see it so your ability to be is not based on their ability to see. David is confidently called. He's, he's walking in this confidence. And watch this. He, he couldn't not just go in the house. See, here's the problem. Many of you right now, the, the truth be told, if it were you, you would have never got anointed. Let me tell you why. Because your attitude and your perspective is wrong. I know you didn't come to church for this. I thought this was motivation. He's supposed to be a preacher. He's supposed to speak into my life. What's he talking about my attitude for? Because you got one. And here's the thing. Your life won't change because your mind won't change. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. David had to watch... His brothers get called to a place that was for him. He had to watch them go through an experience that should have been his. That his father didn't see, his brothers didn't see, but he had to watch them. That it was all said and done. Then Samuel goes, do you have any more sons? He says, oh, there's one more. Dirty David, he's in the yard. Dirty David. He's in the yard, and they say, go get him. David comes in the house. Mm. That's where y'all missed it. See, some of y'all would have had an attitude like, oh, now y'all want me? I ain't going in there. Oh, now you want to call me. And you're mad because some people tried to walk in some spaces that were for you. <laughs> 
Okay, I, I, I shared this. I, I don't, at, at the risk of divorce, I got to share this. Um, um, my, my kids owe me for, because of this. Uh, they could have had another dad. Because um, there was somebody, somebody's that my wife dated before me. And God used me as a Moses to deliver her, to draw her out. Now imagine if I said because she dated this frog looking dude, he was froggy. Y'all could have had a different pastor. Y'all better thank God. Understand, because imagine if I just let it go because she dated some dude that wasn't worth it. No, because she was for me, I let her get it out of her system. Because God has a way of making room for what's yours. Who am I talking to? And God wanted David to see that he didn't have to fight for what was his. He just had to walk into what was his. And can I tell y'all, some of y'all trying to fight for some stuff that already belongs to you. But you don't got to fight for it. You just got to walk in it. You just got to be confidently called. Because if it's for you, it's for you. And it doesn't matter who walks through the door. Doesn't matter who test drives it. Doesn't matter who dates him or her. Doesn't matter who gets the job before you. Doesn't matter who's on the team before you. Because God said it's yours. It's yours. Walk through the door. So you got to change your perspective and your attitude that just because you weren't the first round draft doesn't mean you weren't chosen first. <laughs> Even the Bible says the first will be last, but the last will be first. So I don't need you to see me as long as God sees me. Then I'll always be in the right position at the right time. Oh, my God. Let me. Let me move. Um, D David's dealing with this, and he's, he's, he's walking through the door. He gets the oil from the Lord. Samuel anoints him, and it's poured on him. And the Bible says from that day forward that the Spirit of God was on David, and he was anointed. I got to go. Here's the challenge. David is still a shepherd. He has a king's anointing in a shepherd's position. So my question is that David, when he goes back after this, he's, he's anointed in the presence of his enemies. I mean, his family. And, and, and now he's anointed king, but he has to go back to work. He has to go back to his assignment. And, and sometimes we get these anointing moments where we think just because God spoke to us, we don't got to do nothing anymore. Just because God used us this one time, we don't got to do anything anymore. Just bump somebody and say, go back to work. Go ahead and tell them. Because your work is a sign of your faithfulness that God will open the door when it's time. But, but watch this. David goes, and he's a shepherd in the yard, and, and God allows him to be in this position with this new anointing. And he goes, and his father says, I want you to go to the battlefield. And I want you to take lunch to your brothers. I want you to serve people that you're greater than. I have a question. I can't preach it the way I want to, but I just have a quick question for you. How do I handle the seasons in my life where what I'm anointed for is greater than what I'm instructed to do? When my current anointing is greater than my current instructions, you have to be careful that you don't ever get to the point where you think you're greater than what God's calling you to in the moment. You never outgrow cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> I know it's going to get quiet. You, you, never, you, you never outgrow doing work around the building, and you never outgrow humility, and you never outgrow helping someone, and you never outgrow giving people time that are in need. Just, some, just tell somebody you don't grow some stuff. You, David is Uber Eats. He goes to the battlefield, and the Bible says before... Now, now, watch this. I told you because we didn't even get to Goliath. See, we're trying to jump to promotion, but we didn't get to Goliath. 
We're still in preparation. See, if you don't get preparation good, then you'll never get Goliath. So he's still in preparation. He has to go to the battlefield to de deliver lunch. When he goes to the battlefield, watch this. David recognizes his ability. He knows what's in him. He, he knows there's something inside of him. Why? Because God is with him. Yeah. Said that day when he was anointed, God was with him. He had a covenant. When he gets there and he's looking, Goliath's on the other side. And he's going crazy. He's putting up his middle finger, a couple other fingers, gang signs, what up? He's saying a bunch of crazy stuff. And he's looking. David's like, yo, 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 yo you let, y'all got all these soldiers. All, all these big dudes who do CrossFit. Oh, I seen Billy Blanks and Tybo Troop. I see, I see. Y'all, I seen the, what y'all, y'all let him. Yo, y'all supposed to be gay, big bro. His big brothers are there because they're, they're soldiers. They're bigger than him. They're stronger than him. And they're older than him. But none of them are ready to fight. Davis, the youngest and smallest. I don't know what that's like, but he's the youngest of smiles, and he's, he's there, and he's, he's looking, he's like, um, uh, I won't, he, he, he's, 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 he's looking, and he's like, um, ain't nobody gonna, gonna do nothing, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of the, Lord? see, y'all don't even know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. The reason David was confident it's because he made a connection. He said, uncircumcised Philistine. The reason that uncircumcised was a big deal, because uncircumcision meant there was no covenant. Yeah. So he says, we're supposed to have promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has no promise. Yeah. We have covering. Yeah. He has no covering. Yeah. We got God fighting for us. He has no God fighting for him, and y'all scared. Okay, y'all missed that. See, this is the thing. He was in position because of his faithfulness to follow instructions. He would have never been in position to get ready to get in front of Goliath if he stopped serving and being a shepherd at home and being obedient to the instructions that his father gave him. You got to understand what God is doing in you. It starts with your ability to be humble and follow instruction so he can get you to the next place. But we're not even getting into Goliath yet. We're still talking about David's preparation because David shows up and he's like, listen, I want all the smoke. I, I want the beef. I, I want problems. I I'm ready for it. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to do something. And here's where the problem happens. He has to deal with criticism again. See, he dealt with it at home on a smaller scale. But now he's in front of the whole army. He's in front of his countrymen. Now everybody gets to see it. And, and, and the Bible says Goliath is looking like, who's this little boy? Saul is looking like, <laughs> yo, send this little guy to me. And even his brothers and everybody's looking like, yo, this little dude think he's about to go and fight. But watch this. Let me find you and then we're going to go home. Let's, let's look at the Bible because we got to see it in verse 38 where we started. At, it said, and then Saul gives David his armor. David puts it on, straps on a sword. He takes a step or two to see what it was like because he never tried it on before. Uh, and, and, and what happens? David is too heavy for him. So he says, I can't go in these. I can't do it like this. I got to take this off. I'm, I'm not used. To, this is uncomfortable and uncommon and unfamiliar and different than what God showed me. So he took it off. Again, you got to see this because it means that he put it on more than once. But he got to the point where he said it's time to fight. I can't fight with stuff that doesn't fit me. So I have to stop trying what's not working. So he takes them off again, and here's the key. He picks up five smooth stones from a stream, puts them into, what does it say? His shepherd's bag. I love the details of the Bible. Then armed only with what? His shepherd's staff and his shepherd's sling, he started across the valley to fight 
the Philistine. Here's where we got to go, and I got to say good afternoon. Here's point number three. Write this down because it's going to help you live. Only carry what connects to your calling. Oh, God, let me say it to you. Only carry what connects to your calling. See, the thing was, David knew who he was, and he wanted to be. The Bible said he was anointed, but still a shepherd. He stayed at the house, still shepherding the sheep. When his father called him, he called him as a shepherd. When he gets to the battlefield, he gets to the battlefield as a shepherd. He doesn't change now that God called him. He stayed faithful to who he was, and God anointed who he was, not who they wanted him to be. And can I tell somebody, your anointing is in your authenticity your anointing is not in putting on something and performing for people your anointing and your calling is not about who's around you and who agrees God said I'm going to prepare you for what I've called you to walk in and there's some of you right now that have to understand the potency of your calling your calling has power and it has purpose how do I know how do I know my calling has purpose because you're different and stop allowing you being different to make you uncomfortable God when he anoints David in front of his brothers he calls the first seven seven being completion and perfection God says I'm not using what used to be perfect I'm not using what everybody thinks is the right thing Dr. Crisma said it best. She said strange strategies. That there's some ways that God's getting ready to work that you're not even going to see it. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, I hear you, Lord. That there's some things God's getting ready to stir up that's going to be different than how you thought it was going to go. And he's going to use the small things in your life for the biggest things the biggest victories in your David wasn't the biggest but he was the coldest I know that didn't make sense but it felt good just tell somebody I'm not the biggest but I'm the coldest yeah God called you you're the most qualified because God qualified you for the call so I'm not gonna put on stuff that doesn't fit my call I'm only gonna carry what's connected to my calling I'm gonna use what I know works Watch this. This is why you can't run from difference. Because David was different. He uses something they've never seen at war. He uses, he has this, he has this shepherd's rod, but he really has a slingshot and five smooth stones. And, and they've never seen this. They're prepared for Saul's ammunition. They're prepared for Saul's weaponry. That's why Goliath had a guy who held his shield. And Goliath held his sword. He had all the right parts because he was used to fighting that type of enemy. But God said, I'm getting ready to deal with a familiar enemy with a different tactic. I'm going to use different to defeat it. Oh, my God, I hear you. And, and I don't know about you, but I hear the Lord saying, I'm getting ready to use different to defeat it. I know the old generation, they used to take money and put it in their bra and that was the bank, but God's getting ready to use different to defeat it. Take that money out your bra and go put it in the bank and get you a savings account because he's going to use different to defeat it. I know in the past when people had issues in their marriage, they wouldn't get publicly divorced. They would just sleep in two different bedrooms for 30 years till somebody dies. But the devil is a liar. We're going to fix this foolishness. We sleeping in the same bed if we're paying the same bills. Why? Because God is going to use different to defeat it. I know your kids might look crazy right now and the world is telling them, let them try it. Let them try to work on some stuff. The devil is a liar. No. You are are going to live according to the word of God. Young man, you're a boy. Young lady, you're a girl. And there's no confusion. Why? Because I'm going to use something different to defeat it. And there's some of you right now, you keep trying to go with what everybody thinks and society to please people. But God's not using what's coming. He's going to use something different. Somebody shout, I'm different. 
He's getting ready to use different to defeat it. He's getting ready to use different to bring your family out. He's getting ready to use different to bless you. He's getting ready to use different to bring you to another level. He's getting ready to use different to add increase. He's getting ready to use different to bless your family. He's getting ready to use different to take your marriage to another place. Somebody shout different. I want to tell you that when Saul tries to put his armor on David it was a scam because David had to make sure he didn't respond to the call of Saul <laughs> just tell somebody be careful whose call you answer Saul called him and said take my armor but, but Holy Ghost showed him that was scam likely because uh, there's something in this call that's not for me <laughs> he, he might not have meant wrong it was just wrong person that worked for them but not for the giant I gotta fight this is why Goliath was undefeated because he knew how to handle those weapons but do you understand that the Goliath in your family and the Goliath in your life is not ready for what you're carrying. And the moment you dummy yourself down and go back to some old weaponry. Okay, let me remix that. Some old thinking. Some old attitude. Some old perspective. Old way you carried yourself. Old crowd. The moment you go back to what doesn't work, you're never going to have the victory over your Goliath. And David says to them, he says, we have covenant. Covenant is a calling. Covenant helps me not to, in, uh, it, it helps me not to entertain the scams. It helps me to hang up quick. It helps me to say, <laughs> ignore. Uh, just go ahead, practice. I ignore. Come on, just, you, come on, get that anointed finger. That 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 finger. Come on, y'all online. Go ahead and get that that finger. Just ignore. Get some swag with it. Just ignore. Yeah, I'm just mm, mm. ignore. God's getting ready to. In, uh, he's getting ready to anoint your ignore. Yeah, there's an anointing in your ignore button. So next time he calls you, ladies, <sighs> ignore. Next time she texts you, hey, big head, I'm just. Ignore. The next time they try to talk you into it, just. Next time they try to pull you back. Next family cookout. Just stop. I'm going, but. Ignore. Ignore. The enemy is always going to try to scam you out of position. What I learned, we're going to pray. What I've learned, he can't take anything from you. All he can get you to do is to give it up freely. It's the power of suggestion. Think about this. Two same scenarios, two different responses, and then we're going to pray. First time we see the power of suggestion is in the Garden of Eden when Satan appears through the snake and he goes to Eve and he's like, um, why don't you eat this fruit? couldn't make her eat it he couldn't stuff it in her mouth and make her bite it she had to be a willing participant in her disobedience and and all he could do is offer it he says check this out the day you eat it you'll be like God scam everybody say scam likely um, she didn't understand that because she didn't realize she was already made in the image of God and she already knew the difference of right and wrong and good and evil because she knew if she obeyed God, it would be good. And if she disobeyed God, it would be bad. She knew the difference. But he still scammed her to the point where she saw it and said, uh, it is good for food and I do want to be like God. So she took a bite and she gave it to her husband. He took a bite because they got scammed. He couldn't make them. He could only suggest. Yes. Same thing happens. Jesus now. After he's baptized, God confirms him and affirms him in front of the world. He's now going led in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil comes. He says, if you're really the son of God, do this, do this, do this. He only can offer suggestions, but no power. 
But, but Jesus didn't answer the scam because he had the word. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And see, this is the power of the word of God. If you have it, it is written. It helps you to ignore on, yeah. the scam. And many of us answer the scam likely because we don't have a word already. And what God wants to do in your life, he wants to bring you to a place that you can walk in the word. Can we stand all over this room? Was this message a blessing to at least 17 people? I'm good. I see it. That's cool. I, I'll take my shoes off if I have to. It's all right.